gather the people, enter the feast. All are invited, the greatest and least. The banquet is ready, now to be shared. Join in the heavenly feast that God has prepared. Around this table we dine as kin, beloved family of God. We share the body of Christ the Lord, here we become what we Gather the people, enter the feast, all are invited, the greatest and least. The banquet is ready, now to be shared, join in the heavenly feast that God has prepared. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. We gather to celebrate these sacred mysteries, knowing God's unsurpassable love, and knowing our own human frailty and weakness. Let us come before God and ask for mercy. I confess. Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Full of the 
of your kindness surpass the merits and the desires of those who entreat you. Pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to us. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate. So from the soil, the Lord fashioned all the wild beasts and all the birds of heaven. Then he brought to the, these he brought to the man to see what he would call them. Each one was to bear the name the man would give it. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of heaven, and all the wild beasts. But no helpmate suitable for man was found for him. So the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and enclosed it in flesh. The Lord God built the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. The man exclaimed, This at last is bone from my bones, and flesh from my flesh. This is to be called woman, for this was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and joins himself to his wife, and they become one body. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. We see in Jesus, one who was for a short while made lower than the angels, and is now crowned with glory and splendor because he submitted to death. By God's grace, he had to experience death for all mankind. As it was his purpose, to bring a great many of his sons into glory. It was appropriate that God, for whom everything exists and through whom everything exists, should make a perfect, thorough suffering. The leader who would take them to their salvation. For the one who sanctifies and the ones who are sanctified are of the same stock. That is why he openly calls them Brothers, the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Some Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it against the law for a man to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He answered them, what did Moses command you? Moses allowed us, they said, to draw up a writ of dismissal and so to divorce. Then Jesus said to them, it was because you were so unteachable that he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is why a man must leave father and mother, and the two become one body. They are no longer two, therefore, but one body. So then, what God has united, man must not divide. Back in the house, the disciples questioned him again about this. And he said to them, the man who divorces his wife and marries another is guilty of adultery against her. And if a, man, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she is guilty of adultery too. People were bringing little children to, them, to him for him to touch them. And the disciples turned them away. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of, of God belongs. I tell you solemnly, anyone who does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Then he put his arms round them, laid his hands on them, and gave them his blessing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise I want to start by apologizing. A young woman reminded me through her aunt that last week I, I should have warned because she nearly hit the dashboard. I didn't tell you to put on your seat belts. This week I want to tell you not only make sure your seat belts on, make sure your airbags are functioning. Okay? The warning has been given. This is one of the toughest texts in the whole of Christianity. And the nice thing is that it's not just tough for us living in the 21st century. It was tough for the apostles who lived in the time of Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, 
the, the, the apostles say to Jesus, well, if this is how it is, who will get married? They couldn't understand how this could be possible. And, and it's clear, from, from, certainly from Matthew's account of it, that the, this teaching was not received well. Not by the Pharisees, not by the apostles, not by any, any of them. And, and so, yeah, buckle up. Sit back and let's relax and, 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 and digest the text a little bit. The Pharisees are approaching him, asking a question, is it against the law for a man to divorce his wife? And it goes on to say they were testing him. They were testing him. Jesus' answer is always with a question. What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed us, they said, to draw up a writ of dismissal and to divorce. Now, that comes from Deuteronomy. In the, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses allows for the case of indiscretion, and it's a very technical Hebrew term that, that we can't find an easy equivalent for, but the, for the case of indiscretion, that a man can write up a writ and divorce his wife. And, and that means that there's no arbitrator. There's no arbitrator. It's, it's a man to determine that this is an indiscretion that is worthy of divorce. And, and once a man determines it is an indiscretion worthy of divorce, then it is up to the man to write up the writ and hand it, put it in the hand of his wife and then she leaves, she has to leave the house then and, and figure out what to do next with her life. There were two rabbis that the Pharisees argued between. One of the, the rabbis said, no, no, what, what Moses was speaking about was something like sexual immorality, adultery. And, and in the case of adultery, then, which is an extreme case, then the man can write up a, a writ of, of divorce and divorce his wife. Another rabbi suggested it, it, it is not something as extreme as adultery. It's really it, it, anything that displeases, displeases the husband. Like if, she, if he, she burned the food, he could write up a writ and divorce her. <laughs> yeah, we've come a long way, huh? If he burned the food, now I'm sorry for him. <laughs> and so the, the question and the debate was about which of these two rabbis was giving the, the authentic teaching. And what Jesus does, as he always does, he goes to the heart of the matter. Because by going to the heart of the matter, he, he shows the fallacy of the argument at its very core and essence. He says to them, it was because you were so unteachable that he wrote this commandment. Now, the real word is hard-hearted. The, the Greek really speaks about hard-hearted. And, and you have to remember when we come to Advent, we hear, do not stay awake lest your heart be coarsened by debauchery, drunkenness, and the care of this world. So hard-heartedness is as opposed to being in God's love and, and, and being in authentic spirituality. It, it has been, been under the spell of, of debauchery, of drunkenness, and the care of this world. The, the three big things that pull us away from God. So when he says it's because you are unteachable or hard-hearted, he, he's saying because you were unable to hear God and you were unavailable to God, that Moses gives this provision. But it was a provision because you were, were hard-hearted. That's why he gave the provision. And he goes on further to say, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That is why a man must leave father and mother and the two become one body. They are no longer two, therefore, but they are one body. And, and from that, we, we go to our first reading today, where we see the book of, of Genesis. 
And in Genesis, we see how God created. First, he created the man, and he fashioned, and then he said it's not good for the man to be alone. So we're talking now about original loneliness, or original solitude that the man was in. And then he creates all, or he fashions all the wild beasts and the birds of heaven, all, all the animals that were created, and, and he brings them to the man to name, but none of these animals are suitable as a helpmate for the man. You know, some people today believe that their dog is their best companion and helpmate. And, and, and what the text is saying is, is that as, as all these domestic animals, horses, dogs, cats, whatever they are, cows, all these domestic animals are, are, are very good in terms of companionship for man, but they're not a suitable helpmate. There's a, big, there's a, there's a difference in kind here that, that the text is pushing us to. And, and when, when all of that is done, he gave the names to all of them. And the, the man gives names to all the cattle, all the birds all of the heaven, and all the wild beasts. But no helpmate suitable for man was found for him. So the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and enclosed it in flesh. And the Lord God built the rib he had taken from the man into the woman and brought her to the man. The ancient rabbis commenting on the text says that God took the rib from the side of the man to make the woman. He didn't take a piece of his head so that she would be above him. Nor did she, he take a piece of his foot so that she should be beneath him. He took casing for his heart so that she should be besides him and he should be vulnerable to her. And, and here's where we have the challenge. God creates the two equal but different. Equal but? Like all you going to sleep. <laughs> equal but? Equal but different. We think Equal means equal in every way, equivalent. Equal does not mean equivalent. It means that in our differences, we are still equal. And here's the problem with the provision that Moses gave. It came down to the man seeing the woman, his wife, as part of his property that he could dispense of as and when he, he liked. And therefore, it destroyed the very core of, the, of the, the, the message out of Genesis. That these two are equal, but different. And so by giving the provision that Moses gave, the provision was translated as the man being above the woman, as, his, as her owner, and, and as her, her owner could decide when he, it was convenient to keep ownership and when it was convenient to dispense of ownership. And, and because of that, Jesus' challenge of the law is challenging precisely, precisely what is at the very core that the man and the woman are equal but different. And that's why in, in Mark's gospel, there's a stinger in the gospel that most people miss. The man who divorces his wife and marries another is guilty of adultery against her. All right, fair enough. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she is guilty of adultery too. The thought of a woman divorcing her husband would have been impossible in that, in that society. That, that, that would have been just outrageous. But to make the point that, that the two are equal but different, Marx throws into the mix the second part of the equation to say that it is not only the man who could divorce, because what good for the goose? Well, you know that one. Uh -uh. True. What a thing. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. 
And, and what, what Jesus is getting to here is, is that the, the two, the husband and the wife, we, we can't see them in terms of property. Nor can we see them in terms of one above and the other beneath. That's not what God intended from the beginning. What he intended from the beginning is that the two, different as they are, would be complementary. And then their complementarity, that is how we will know the, the amazing love of, of this God. In the complementarity of the male and the female. In Jesus' text, he actually quotes from two texts. The one that, that we read from the beginning, from, from the Genesis. But he, he quotes from an earlier text in, in, in Genesis where he talks about them, God made them male and female. And the text of Genesis goes on to say, in his image and likeness he made them. In his image and likeness he created them. The image and likeness of God is a complementarity of the male and the female. Not the male alone, not the female alone, but the male and the female together in their difference is how we find the image and likeness of God. It is in the complementarity that, that you, you start to glimpse a God who is Trinity because Father is not Son and Son is not Father and Spirit is not Father or Son. And, and in their difference, you see a, 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 an energy of love that is flowing. And that's why St. Paul in Ephesians 5 talks about the male-female relationship in marriage as being a sacrament of the, of the God that we have not yet seen. A sacrament of the, of the inner life of the Trinity. Because as, as we see the complementarity between the male and the female in marriage, we also start to understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are different, equal, one, three, and hold a, a, a unity of love and purpose and mission and, and that's that's the image that marriage is following it isn't that the trinity is patterned after us we are patterned after the trinity and that's why in in ephesians st paul will say wives and husbands submit to one another in the Lord. That's where he starts, eh? That husbands and wives must submit to one another in the Lord. To one another in the Lord. In other words, that the husband and the wife must make the will of God what they both are striving for. And by striving after the will of God, they submit to one another. You know how we do it today. We do win lose real good, you know. Only gone silent today, boy. The seatbelt choking you, what? The seatbelt choking you. We do win lose real good, real good. Somebody always winning and somebody always losing. And that win lose proposition is destroying marriage and family life. And and it's really a reflection of, of the hubris of, of 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 our age, where where we all believe that we have to win is also reflective of the deep wound of our civilization where, where we all feel so done upon that we feel somehow we, we have to feel like a human person and the only way to feel good is, is to win, to dominate somebody else. And we feel that by dominating somebody else, we become a real person. But, but, but that, is, that is the opposite of the Christian path. The Christian path is both husband and wife submit to the Lord. And in submitting to the Lord, you, you submit to one another. Because you, your, your, your first thing is, is what is the Lord asking? When Jesus gives his teaching, he says, they're no longer two, but they become one body. And we see that in the, in the Genesis story. That, and while they slept, they took the ribs and the, the Lord built the rib and made them into flesh. And it ends by saying, this is why a man leaves, leaves his father and mother, 
joins or cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. There's three verbs in this sentence. Leave, cleave, become. One flesh. And, and that's the original understanding of marriage. And, and the leaving, you know what, people are married for years and years and they leave here. Mommy Kalalu still better, or whatever it might be. Leave, because you have to, this new unit has to, has to be seen and has to become your first commitment. The first commitment in your life. And, and the other big challenge and, 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 and foolishness we do today, that, that the, the parents make the children their first commitment. The children are not your first commitment. Your first commitment is God. That's your first commitment. Your second commitment is your spouse. That's your second commitment. Your children are your third commitment. When you make the children your, your first commitment, you displace both God and your spouse. And that's another big challenge in marriage today. Because once the children are more important than the spouse, the children have nothing to look to, to understand the, the, the union of, of, of husband and wife and what that really means. The spouses have to be the second commitment. Because you're left to cleave. The becoming one flesh, is, is that involves the children. The, 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 the one flesh that you are becoming is the a, is a children and the offspring that are being produced. And here we have the whole theology of marriage laid out. John Paul wrote about six or 700 pages on, on this one, one little text that we're run, we, we running with here. Because it's so important to us and because we so misunderstood it. When, when Jesus says here, anyone who divorces and remarries is, is, makes, commits adultery. And I want to be clear here. We've had one consistent erroneous teaching. People have been told if they got divorced, they can't come to communion. That's not true. If you divorce and you remarried, you can't come to communion. If you divorce and in your sexual relationship, you can't come to communion because that's adultery. But if you divorce and you really didn't want the divorce, but whatever happened, happened, and you're not in any relationship with anybody, there is no bar to communion for you. None. And, and that's, that's one of the big errors that many people have been perpetuating. The second thing is this. When it talks about adultery, it's talking about the sixth commandment. And the sixth commandment covers a range of things. Because Jesus will say in Matthew's gospel, if, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already sinned against her. Hmm. I suppose this is a vice versa story, you think? Uh, is it? I don't know. You all help me now. I don't have experience on the other side. If you, if you, if you think or look lustfully, it is already adultery, Jesus would say. And, and, and that covers a whole range of things. We, we live in the most sexualized age that has ever been. We, we, we are bombarded with sexual images everywhere. We, we, we live in, a, in not only the world culture, not only the internet culture, but, but Trinidad and Tobago is the most sexualized place you'll find anywhere. And, and, and the, 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 the unbridled sexual energy that, that is displayed openly and consistently creates a culture of, of concubiscence, of lust, that, that makes lust into a virtue and makes people believe that, that this, this thing is a way of living. And it is not. It is totally unhealthy. It is unhealthy. So what Jesus is prescribing here is really the only way to true happiness. The only way. That, that we have to understand, although divorce and, and remarriage is, is so prevalent today, and, and the church is doing everything to be pastorally present to people who are divorced and remarried. We're doing everything that we can. Maybe not enough. But, 
but we still have to understand that this was a teaching that Jesus was willing to lose disciples over. And therefore, we can't play with the teaching. You know, up until the 1930s, well, up until the, the, the Protestant Reformation, everybody agreed that this was a, that the divorce and remarriage was wrong. Everybody agreed that, up to the Pro Protestant Reformation. Up to the 1930s, most of the mainline churches agreed that divorce and remarriage was wrong and contraception was wrong, up to the 1930s. In the 1930s, most of the other churches left us and left us as Catholic Church standing alone. And the cheese now stands alone. We are the only one who keeps the teaching that Jesus has given from the beginning. And many say that makes us outmoded, that, that we, are, we are kind of anachronistic. Uh, uh, we, we have to get with the times. Well, well, his disciples couldn't get with the times. We have to stay with Jesus. This is a difficult teaching. It covers all the aspects of lust. Because if you don't start from young to live a life of virtue and chastity, if you don't start from young to live chastity and virtue, it would not appear when you get older. And, and that's why marriage is the, 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 the cornerstone of civilization. That's why it is. Because it is in marriage that the children learn how to live chastity. Because they see it before their eyes. It is in marriage they realize how you do real relationships. They see it before their eyes. Imperfect as it is. Today let us pray for all of us. For all of us who find the reading tough and difficult. Let us pray that this God of ours will give us the courage, the wisdom and the insight. Not only to understand with our head, but to yield our heart. To submit our heart our will, our intellect to what he's teaching us, that we would bend our heart to his will. Amen. Amen. Let us profess our faith in God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Father, we pray mercy upon this world of ours, seduced by lust, turning concubiscence into virtue, distorting your original intention of creation of man and woman. We pray, O oh God, that in your, in your graciousness, in your love, your mercy, that you show us what you intend and give us courage to live all that you ask of us. Lord, hear us. Lord, For our Holy Father, as he continues to lead the church, give him courage and wisdom. Lord, hear us. For our leaders, as they continue to lead us in this time, give them courage, Lord, that they may find the path to peace and stability. Lord, hear us. For all married couples, we pray today, give them the grace, the conversion of heart, the courage to hear this word and to move steadily towards it. Lord, hear us. We bring our prayer to the Father through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. O God of all creation, forever blessed and praised, we have this bread to offer from what the fields have raised. 
What earth and sky have nurtured and human hands have made, it will become the level of life forever laid. great goodness in giving us the vine. We have this gift to offer, the chalice filled with wine. The fruit of your creation and work of human skill, may it for us, your children, eternal life distill. Pray that your sacrifice and mine may be pleasing and acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice for the praise and glory of his name. the of all his holy church. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrifices instituted by your commands and through the sacred mysteries which we celebrate with dutiful service. Graciously complete the sanctifying work by which you are pleased to redeem us through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, his death we celebrate in love, his resurrection we confess with living faith, and his coming to glory we await with unwavering hope. And so with all the angels and the saints we praise you, as without end we acclaim. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the Jewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At the time that he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. Once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is a chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith.
therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spreads throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, the bishops of the AC region and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face and have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who please you throughout the ages, we may merit to be coerced to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through him and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy. Take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be
God of ours, we know that we are one body, one body in Him. We also know that husbands and wives become one body, one flesh in Him. And what God has joined together, no one can divide. In our hearts, let us see all the ways in which we have brought division to what God has united. Through baptism, we have been united with each other as part of his mystical body. Through marriage, the spouses have been united as one body, one flesh. Let us recognize the ways in which our willfulness, our desire to dominate, our insecurities have sought after uh, Lord it in over and sought after a way of, of being that has not brought harmony to our home to our church to our nation as the family goes so the nation goes let us ask God for the grace in our family today that we may find the path that he desired for us and the path for which he called us to be family and let us come with a spirit of true repentance today recognizing all the ways in which we have sinned against the body the body of Christ and the one body 
of the spouses that have been united together by him. Father, I pray today for all married couples that even in difficulty and challenge, Lord, that they would hear this word and in hearing this word that they will find a way to live what you ask. We pray for the grace of conversion for each one, Lord, and for all of us that we may, we may see the high di dignity to which you have raised, raised marriage. And we may do all in our power, Lord, to support married couples and families and to help each one to become all that you want them to become. And today, Lord, you want to come to us, and we know that. And for those who have not been able to receive you today, we, we pray and we beg, oh God, that you come to them spiritually, that you touch their hearts, Lord, and open their minds and their wisdom and understanding that, that the conversion of heart may happen this day. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Grant us, Almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, and so as to be transformed into what we con consume, we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember that we have to be good to each other, and so if we book, let us show up. Remember that the church is doing everything to keep our spaces as clean, as sanitized, and as safe as possible. So if you're hesitating to come to church, come. Book and come. Go to catholictt.org. You'll find your parish, or if they don't have room, they have quite a few parishes that have room. So you can just search, find where has room. Book. But when you book, you need to show up. You need to show up. Because if you book and save a space, don't show up, you're denying somebody else who could have come to Mass to come. So when we book, let us come. But I know many people are still hesitant, and I understand that. But, but we, are, we are doing everything by, by the rule and by the book, and so let's, let's venture out. And if you're still not comfortable on a weekend when they might have a lot of people, come to a weekday Mass. Book in on a weekday Mass and come. But, but let's start returning now. This is a time where we've, we've tested our, 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 all of our standards, we've tested our protocols, we know what we're doing. So let's start returning during the week or during the weekend, but let's start coming back out. We want to see you, we miss you, we love you, and we want you worshiping with us, not just receiving spiritual communion, but the real flesh that he wants us to eat, the real food that he offers to us. Amen? Amen? Remember, if you have made pledges for Trinity and you haven't yet, or you want to support the community, remember what you do. Go to Trinity or Living Water page and do that. For the pandemic relief and the, the ongoing of the church, Catholic TT, help us keep going. Because as we do, we keep reaching to you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. let us go glorifying the Lord with our life. Don't forget your Catholic news. And Rhonda sent to tell me to tell you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>